And now to Syria and the aftermath of the airstrikes launched by the U.S., the United Kingdom and France to punish the Syrian regime's alleged use of chemical weapons. As Lisa Desjardins reports, the military strikes have renewed questions about presidential war-making powers. Pentagon video shows the hail of missiles streaking towards Syria on Friday night. Their reported targets, three chemical research and production facilities in Damascus and homes. Satellite pictures displayed the sites hit, here before the launch and then after they were leveled. At an unrelated event in Florida today, President Donald Trump described the strike as a success. They didn't shoot one. You know, you heard, oh, they shot 40 down. Then they shot 15 down. They watched. Then I called. I said, did they? No, sir. Every single one hit its target. Think of that. How genius. <laughs> Not one was shot. Meanwhile, a fact-finding team from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons arrived in Damascus over the weekend. It's on a mission to determine the chemical used in this month's attack on the suburb of Douma that left dozens dead. But as of today, the team said Syria and Russia were blocking them from entering the area. The OPCW called an emergency meeting at The Hague today, and Britain's ambassador to the Netherlands called on the Syrian government and its Russian backers to give the inspectors the access they need. Now, we are obviously keen to make sure that the inspectors uh, have every means that they can to carry out their job and carry out their investigation as soon as possible. And we see no reason why they should not be able to get to Duma. The U.S. representative to the inspectors group said there are indications that Russian teams went into Duma already. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov told the BBC there was no evidence of chemical weapons in Duma and denied suggestions that Russia had tampered with the site. There is no proof that on the 7th of April, chemical weapons were used in Duma. And frankly speaking, uh, all the evidence which they quoted was based on the media reports and on social networks. Order! But in the House of Commons, British Prime Minister Theresa May said Russia was covering up the attack. This as Washington apparently prepared to fire another economic salvo at Moscow. UN Ambassador Nikki Haley spoke Sunday of new sanctions on Russian firms the U.S. believes helped Syria's chemical weapons program. But the Washington Post reported this afternoon that Mr. Trump was not yet ready to impose those sanctions and had ordered a delay. The airstrikes came weeks after President Trump said he wants the U.S. military out of Syria entirely. French President Emmanuel Macron said yesterday that he'd convinced President Trump to maintain a presence in Syria, but he walked back those comments today. I didn't indicate any change yesterday. I never said that either the United States or France would stay engaged militarily in the long term in Syria. White House spokeswoman Sarah Sanders said today the president still wants to bring troops home from Syria but there's no timeline yet for their exit. President Trump's actions last week were not specifically approved by Congress. There was no authorization to use military force. In the past few minutes, a group of leading bipartisan senators have unveiled a bill to rewrite current authorizations to use force in Iraq and against ISIS. For more of the question of the president's authority, I'm joined by one of that bill's co-sponsor, Senator Chris Coons of Delaware. He also sits on the Senate Foreign Relations and Judiciary Committees. Thank you, Senator. Thank now, you, looking over the outline of your bill, it does not deal specifically with Syria, but instead with the fight against terrorism and Iraq. I want to ask you about the airstrikes against Syria. Do you believe the president had the authority? Were those lawful airstrikes last week? Well, this is a gray area, Lisa, and one of the reasons that I've engaged in moving forward with this bipartisan bill that Senators Corker and Kane are leading uh, is to try and reassert some of Congress's authority and responsibility in the taking of military action. It's been now 17 years since the 9-11 strikes that led to the 2001 authorization for the use of military force. Um, and I think those initial authorizations from 2001 and 2002 uh, against uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, against uh, Taliban and al-Qaeda, have been so extended and so overused by both the Bush and Obama administrations uh, that today they are no longer timely and relevant. And so it's long past due time for the United States Congress to step up and take our role in crafting an AOMF that fits our current situation.
It is not clear to me that President Trump has a plan for our path forward in Syria or that these strikes were appropriately authorized. And we should mention that we did reach out to the White House to invite them or someone from the White House to appear on this program. They did not supply anyone, but we do hope to have that voice on the show sometime soon. Obviously, this is something you've been working on a long time, Senator. I've heard you on the floor, I've seen you in here and talk about this a long time. And I know that you want Congress to ring in here. But can we talk about the balance of power more globally? Why has Congress, it seems, almost given full power to the president in, in essence, has the Congress no longer any say, essentially, and let presidents do what they want with the military. Well, this has been a long time coming. Um, since the 1970s, uh, in military action after military action, president after president uh, has done more and more uh, to skirt around Congress's role, and Congress has not reasserted itself. Uh, in 2001 and 2002, Congress stepped up uh, and passed authorizations that were specific to the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. But since then, we have not acted. Uh, late in, Obama, in President Obama's administration, I worked uh, to try and persuade White House counsel uh, and the president to work with the then Democratic majority uh, in the Senate uh, to try and replace the 2001 AUMF, but was unsuccessful. Senator Kane has really led these efforts in the Democratic caucus, and I'm hopeful that we're going to have a robust debate and a vote in the Foreign Relations Committee in the weeks ahead. I think we owe no less uh, to the men and women of our armed forces who are currently carrying out missions around the world, and I think we owe it to the American people to be clear about what role Congress is going to take and for us to take some responsibility, uh, which we frankly uh, have allowed to slip from our grasp over the many years since uh, the 2001 beginning of the global war on terror. Senator, this conversation often centers around the Middle East, Syria, Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, but you spend a lot of time in Africa. You know that the United States has troops and, in fact, deploys drones, is involved in military action in dozens of countries around the world. Where is the line? Should, for instance, drone strikes be something that Congress approves briefly? Well, I think this is exactly why we need to have this debate, uh, is because last year when four American soldiers tragically were lost on uh, line of duty in Niger in West Africa, uh, I think there were many Americans and many senators who were unaware uh, that there were Americans uh, engaged in a train and equip mission in West Africa. Um, there are members of the Intelligence Committee, the Armed Services Committee, uh, who do stay up to date on this, and I do as well on foreign relations, uh, but there's many others uh, who don't. So I think it's long past time for us to debate where we are engaging in military conduct and of what kind. And, Senator, briefly, you've also proposed a bill to limit the president's ability to fire special counsel Mueller on a different topic, yes. the Russia investigation. What is your concern there? Uh, well, uh, Republican Senator Tom Tillis and uh, Lindsey Graham joined with Democratic Senator Cory Booker and me in introducing a bipartisan bill. Uh, we are hopeful it's going to get marked up next week in the Judiciary Committee. Um, I think given the ways that uh, President Trump has been tweeting um, more and more aggressively uh, challenging Robert Mueller's special counsel investigation. It's no longer a question of if but when. He will take some action to try and restrict or end that investigation, whether by firing Rod Rosenstein uh, or by directly trying to interfere with the investigation. Current Justice Department regulations prohibit that. Uh, but I'm concerned, given very recent developments, that the president may act abruptly. Senior Republican senators have said publicly uh, that that would be the end of the Trump presidency, and I'm looking to find a vehicle to allow Republicans and Democrats to work together to make it just a bit harder for the president to act in an abrupt and inappropriate way. This bill would allow the special counsel, if fired, <laughs> to go to a three-judge panel and will allow them to determine that if he was fired inappropriately, he would, allow to, he would be allowed to resume the investigation. Senator Chris Coons of Delaware, thank you. Thank you.